Lord Jesus, step off the pages of the scripture into our lives in such a way that we know you and experience you, your love, your kindness towards us in ways that we've never seen before. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'll never forget getting a text message one morning from a young Citadel cadet. It was from Robert Fink, and it said, I've got your back. It's a great encouragement, especially when you realize who Fink was. Fink was the center lineman for the Citadel's football team. He was huge, is huge. His biceps are the size of my head, and I've got a big head. He's a huge man, and so when a guy like that sends you a text on a Sunday morning that says, Pastor, I've got your back, it makes one or two things happen. It makes you wonder why you need to have somebody having your back in the first place. But secondly, it gives you great confidence to know that you can do whatever you need to do and somebody is there to defend you, to have your back, to do what needs to be done. Could you imagine if you walk throughout all of life with a Fink right next to you? With, well, we called him Finkerbell because we were his friends. But to have a guy like that with you, it give you great confidence. You could go wherever you needed to go without any fear. That's what David experienced last week. David fights a fight with a giant because of his great confidence in God. He doesn't have self-confidence, he has God confidence that causes him to go into a battle against a giant that threatens to beat him down. And that's what life is like for most of us every day, isn't it? We go out of here having been encouraged by the Lord into battles that we variously have. But in the midst of those battles, we can go with that same God confidence because God makes a, con a covenant with each of us. God makes a loyal, loving covenant that is for our good to his detriment. When you look at the cross, you look and see an exchange that is unlike any other where God exchanges his good for our bad. He exchanges everything so that we can gain life in exchange for death. The passages that we're going to be looking at today are all about Jonathan's life. And they're all about Jonathan and David and this, this wonderful confidence that Jonathan, the son of Saul, has in the covenant of God, in faith in God. And what I want you to understand at the end of the day is this, that security is found in covenant. Covenant dispatches fear, it dis demands commitment, and it delivers peace. So what is a covenant? A covenant is a promise. It's a trust, a determined course of action. It's a faith that holds firm when all the world is falling apart. God establishes covenants, or a covenant, throughout the Bible with his people. In Genesis chapter 17, God says, I'll establish my covenant between you and me. I'll ma I will be your God. In Exodus 6, he says, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I deliver you out from under the Egyptians. When David gets in the fight last week with Goliath, David's trusting in that same covenant, that God will be there for his people. Verse 17, in chapter 17, verse 42, it said, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. He will give you into our hand. He goes into battle trusting in one thing and one thing only, and that is that God has his back. When you get to chapter 18, you see that there's one other character in this story. We've seen Saul, we've seen David. Now we see this wonderful man named Jonathan, who is a true believer. He has faith in God such that he's willing to watch and see what God is doing to his own detriment. He sees that God is chosen David in faith, and he realizes this theological significance. He sees things with God eyes. He sees with a worldview that puts God in the center, and he sees that he is not going to be the king, but trusts God's plan in the midst of it. Think about that. Think about the complete insanity of that. Every other king up to this point has happened because of power and because of, of all kinds of things. All the kings of the rest of the world happen through this lineage that, that continues the line of the son from, to the, from the father to the son. And Jonathan says, no, I see God doing something else. 
I'm going to trust that what God is doing is a better legacy, a better way forward for not just me, but for all of us. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3, it says, Jonathan made a covenant with David. And then he gives him his robe, his armor, his bow, his belt. It's all the symbols of his authority. In other words, he divests himself completely of his, of his own rights and instead trusts them to David. Now, the reaction is pretty swift. Um, you see from Saul that he's not too happy with this. He's utterly in disbelief. What happens in 18 verse 6 is this. As they were coming home from the battle, women come out from all the cities of Israel and begin singing this wonderfully helpful song. It goes something like this. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And the text says, and Saul was very angry and eyed David from that day on. You can kind of understand why that would happen, right? You're the king and all of the beautiful women start to line the streets and you're like, all right, this is good. They're all coming out and they start talking about that guy. What? Jonathan sees it and says, yeah, of course. This is the way of God. But Saul doubles down in jealousy and anger. What Jonathan sees is what the whole Old Testament is all about. That God constantly chooses the weak over the strong. He chooses Abel, not Cain. He chooses Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. He chooses Sarah, not Hagar. When you begin to look at the Bible, you begin to realize that God is subverting the customs and the traditions and the ways of this world for his kingdom. God's going to be the king for his people. And he's chosen a prince, David, to follow along. Saul's response? He's going to fight God. Jonathan's response? Faith. That God is going to work it out for his good. Security is found in a covenant that dispatches fear. Chapter 18, verse 12 says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. Saul's jealousy and anger is at God, so much so that he sees God's messenger, God's future king, and he tries to nail him against a wall with a spear. He tries to have um, other people kill him. He tries to have the Philistines kill him. Why is he mad? Because the Lord was with David. Friends, when God reveals his plan to us and it doesn't accord with what we want, with our plan, we tend to get a little crazy sometimes. But God has promised, has said, a loyal love. In fact, in this text, love and the word Yahweh are connected together in this way of, of making it clear that God's love is a loyal, never-ending, never-giving-up, always-for-us kind of love. And what we need simply to do is to fall under that love, to trust him wherever he tells us to go, to look for his kingdom and not our kingdom. And so, after that seven-minute introduction, I will land the plane in a couple more minutes, but I want us to get into chapter 20. Chapter 20 of 1 Samuel is on page three, uh, 243 in your pew Bibles. And it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating text with all kinds of little nuances that really reveal the heart of Jonathan. So turn in your Bibles to page 243 or 1 Samuel chapter 20. It says there in 1 Samuel chapter 20 verse 1, Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt and what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It's not so. But David vowed again, saying, your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. David goes not away from where Saul is, but where Jonathan is. He, he goes towards danger. Why? Because he is going to try to figure out what's going on in Jonathan's heart. And Jonathan makes it clear. His confidence is in God's covenant for the people of God, which includes him, rather than just confidence in his own power. And so he says to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. 
Whatever you need from me, I'm there for you. He's a friend that, that sticks closer than a brother. He's, he's a person who is there trusting that God has a plan. David's world is disintegrating, but in the midst of it, he goes to his friend, to the covenant that they have. And that's what covenants do. Covenants dispatch fear. They give us confidence. They let us move forward in whatever God is doing rather than what we're trying to make happen. If we're following God's plan, not our own, then we have to be willing to cede control, to give up power, to give up prestige. And that's just what Jonathan's doing. Look there in verse 5. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked to leave of me to run to the Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice for all the clan. If he says good, it'll be well with your servant. But if he's angry, then know that harm is determined by him. For some reason, Jonathan can't quite understand that his dad is so jealously angry. And we can kind of understand that, right? There are things that our parents and our grandparents have done that, that shock us, and we just don't know where they come from. But if you look just a little bit deeper, you realize that the same heart resides in all of us when we decide we want to trust in power and our own security. And so that's all it means, it means for Jonathan to see what's really going on. David wants him to see what's really going on in Saul's heart. But in certain times, uncertain times, we can trust that God is the one that will keep us sane, that God is the one that will keep us moving forward. In verse 8, he says, Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there's guilt in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? That's David speaking, and he's speaking and saying, the two of us are under God's authority. The two of us are trusting God in this whole thing. In the midst of the craziness of the world, where all the foundations are falling, the two of us can trust that God is up, up to something bigger than us. And, and so what he does is he says, if I've done wrong, David says to Jonathan, if I've done wrong, then I give you the right to dispatch with my life. He so trusts Jonathan's faith in God that he allows Jonathan to be an arbiter on whether his life is worthy of continuing to live. That's some crazy faith, isn't it? Both of them have this crazy faith in God. That's admirable. It causes us to pause and begin to examine our own selves and wonder, what is it that we have faith in? What, what covenant are we trusting in? When we trust in God's unfailing, never-ending, never-giving-up, always-for-us kind of love, we can have crazy actions that follow. Things that are, bring peace, things that, that bring us into places that we didn't expect because you'll never perish when you're in God's hands. When you seek his loyal love, you know that you're in the safest place in all the world. Covenant demands commitment, though. Look in verse 12. Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be my witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he's well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he's been with my father." If Jonathan was a normal person, he would have killed David right there. If he was normal, he would have dispatched with this one who threatens his own livelihood. But Jonathan's not normal. He's trusting in God to his own detriment. He's seeking first the kingdom of another. He's seeking first God's kingdom and making sure that God's kingdom is the one that glory is found in. Because we can't find glory. It's only fading and it's only momentarily in our own lives. But if we trust in the glory of God, if we seek his kingdom first, then we're putting our faith in something that will last forever. Verse 14 says, If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from the house forever. When the Lord cuts off one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. What he's saying, Jonathan, is saying is, David, let's make sure this goes two ways. Because every other kingdom is secured by dispatching with political rivals. 
And Jonathan is putting his trust in David so much so that when the time comes that he has faith will come, that David is on the throne, that Jonathan and his heirs will not be harmed. And indeed, that's what happens in the rest of the story. Both of them are bound in God's covenant, and it isn't easy. It takes a high commitment. The text goes on in verse 16. He says, And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Read that verse one more time. Verse 16. May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. He's about to find out who David's enemies are. And it's his own father. This is a crazy, loyal love that he has towards David as David's chosen. He's so trusting in what God has planned and what God is going to do that he relies on God even to the detriment of his own father. One writer said, there has seldom if ever been exhibited a finer instance of triumphant faith. Jonathan has a faith that is admirable and beautiful. It's something that we don't see very often, even in our own selves. A faith that trusts that God is on the move, that God is working. That even in our darkest days, in the darkest moments, when our own family is crumbling around us, when our own hopes and dreams are on the line, that we can trust God that he's going to move. It's the same covenant that Jesus has towards us, isn't it? Jesus having all of the power of the kingdom, being at God's right hand, what does he do? He lays it all down, according to Philippians, to come for our salvation. It's crazy love that God has and that Jonathan is picking up on already. He's seen God all the way up to this moment, acting that way in faithful, loyal love, and he's trusting that God will continue to move forward. The scene moves forward. They talk about a signal between the two of them and whereby they'll figure out what Saul is actually doing. And then we come to a scene later at the New Moon Festival where Jonathan is at one end of the table and his father's at the other, and they're wondering where David is. Look in verse 30. Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Nice words there. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore sin and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Saul is murderously angry, and Jonathan answers this way. Why? Why should he put Booth to death? What has he done? And Saul hurls a spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food, and he went. As soon as David's not there, the fireworks begin. Jonathan has become a traitor to his own family dynasty. But Jonathan knew this was going to happen. Deep in his heart, he knew that it was going to happen because he's been seeking God's kingdom, not his kingdom. This is a, a lesson, a testament to all of us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness rather than our own kingdom. Jonathan puts Yahweh's servant, Yahweh's word, Yahweh's promises, Yahweh's kingdoms first before anything else. And he empties himself of everything. He's bound to the covenant of God and trusts, trusts in him over everything else. The scene moves on in verse 41. You see they're out of that place. Jonathan's gone into field to signal to David what's going on. And then in verse 41 it says, And as soon as the boy had gone, the signal, God rose from beside the stone, David rose from behind the stone's heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. Do you hear the words of Jonathan? Jonathan's just come from this disturbing meeting with his father. He's just come from his, seeing his whole world being confirmed as being against the kingdom of God. He's come from one of the most devastating things that you could experience in life, your own family crumbling before your eyes. And he says to David, the one who will take his throne, 
go in peace. Go in peace. His confidence in the Lord is so crazy ludicrous. It doesn't make sense to our eyes because what we want to see is someone, someone building their own kingdom, someone having faith and, and courage and, and going out there on their own strength, but that's not what happens. Jonathan can offer peace because he trusts what God is doing is the better thing. Christians don't have peace because things are peaceful. They have peace because they trust a God who can bring peace ultimately, that ultimately God will make things right. Security is found in covenant. It dispatches fear, it demands commitment, and it delivers peace. And all of us make covenants. At the end of the day, I want to ask you, what covenant are you trusting in? What, what covenant promises do you have? Many years ago, there was a movement called the First Promise Movement, and it was a reminder to priests of our first promise. It's in the Book of Common Prayer. It says this, the bishop says to the ordinan, Will you be loyal to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ as this church has received them? And will you, in accordance with the canons of this church, obey your bishop and other ministers who have authority over you and your work? And here's the response. I am willing and ready to do so, and I solemnly declare that I do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and contain all things necessary to salvation, and I do solemnly engage to worship, to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of the church. Scriptures, number one, that that's where salvation is found, and doctrine, discipline, and worship are where we promise to start everything. When all the world is beginning to go haywire, the important thing is to remember your first promises. To remember, what are we standing on? We're standing on the word of God. And faithfulness to God comes first in his word, looking at it, studying it, meditating it on it, and seeing the crazy ways that he brings life in the midst of the chaos. Questions for you as well. What's the first promise that you made? It's in your baptism. The question was asked of you or your parents and then confirmed later by you. Do you promise to follow Jesus as Lord? In other words, are you willing to see his kingdom first and yours second in every aspect of your life? And the answer is simply, I do. Or at least it should be, I do. Hopefully it is. I would encourage you that when all the world is going crazy and mad around you, when everything seems to be crumbling apart, when you look at society and it just doesn't make sense, when you look at your family and just things don't make sense, go back to your first promise, which is to follow Jesus as Lord. And how are you going to do it? You're going to get down on your knees and you're going to pray and say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love the hymn, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, there is so much sinking sand around us. But you're the rock. There's so much sinking sand in our families. There's so much sinking sand in our culture. There's so much sinking sand in all the aspects of this world that are not aligned in following you. But you are the rock. Give us the courage to stand firm on you and to trust you as Lord and to trust the covenant that you've made with us to be our God and to save us. In your holy name we pray. Amen.